Investing in companies is a good thing. You're creating jobs, you're financing new products that can help make the world a better place. That seems to be a better thing for the world than if you just speculate on real estate. I don't see how you're kind of helping the world, frankly. Alex Vanovic is the CEO of Nansen. The $750 million world-leading on-chain analytics platform. Alex is here to shed light on the crypto industry's anti-fragility and how Nansen deals with industry volatility. Maybe I can lay out the moral reason for why I think people should invest in crypto. If you're collateralizing a pudgy penguin today, the same platform, in theory, could be used to collateralize a real-world asset that's represented by an NFT. The beautiful thing about corporations is that they can go out of business. In the public sector, if something doesn't work, then you give it more money. In the private sector, if something doesn't work, the company collapses. And then some other company comes in and does a better job. Something happened two weeks ago with the Bitcoin ETF. The ETF. I told them, within six months, this man is going to come and sell you this. That's the thing about the ETF. Suddenly, all of TradFi is incentivized to do marketing for Bitcoin. I think there is a good link between Nansen 2 and Alpha. Why should people sign up for Nansen 2? With Nansen 2, the initial motivation to do it was actually just to create a code base that was easier to work with so we had higher product velocity. Like we could ship features faster. Speed is literally one of our values. We literally have made the product itself like 100 times faster. Do you think there is a negative side of having a Bitcoin ETF and going more mainstream? Maybe the negative part would be it. You're Swiss, right? I'm Swiss, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think like Sw Switzerland is a very, you know, functional country as well. I'm Norwegian. I would say it's like semi-functional in the sense that it's it works pretty well, but they also have so much money yeah. from oil that like, yeah. how can you, how can you fuck it up? <laughs> like, yeah. But uh, here, I think what they do super well is they know, they do fewer things and they do th those things very well. Yeah, you know, as the government. What are the few things that you think Singapore are doing really well? So, yeah. what do you like about Singapore so much? Um, a lot of different things, actually. I think overall, if you, of course, this will depend on people's circumstances. But if I look at countries to live in, it's probably the optimal mm. one for me. Absolutely. And so, you know, we just talked about it now. I think it has this incredible blend of east and west. Uh, it has this garden city vibe that is very unique and it, I think it enhances the quality of life, frankly, like day to day, just walking 10 minutes outside, which by the way, many people think that Singapore is not walkable, but it is very walkable in my opinion. Absolutely. You have to be comfortable with sweating a little bit, yeah. but it is very walkable, generally speaking. Like it's quite nice to just walk from, you know, I walk to my gym, it's like 30 minutes, it doesn't matter if I'm sweaty. Mm. And uh, the weather is typically nice, you have like lots of greenery around you. Uh, but I think like the broader point is that it's very safe. D getting anything done is very quick. It's so conven convenient. It's right? super convenient, yeah. right? And this is a mix of private and, and public sector, right? If you think of Gojek or Grab, these are private companies that make your life a lot easier. And it's like three minutes to get a ride and then 10 minutes in the car and you're pretty much anywhere you want to be, right? Yeah. Um, but then there's the public sector part where like you, if you, you know, have gotten an employment pass, that's really smooth. You go to the office, like very little waiting time, at least in my case. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the card like right away. And generally, I always get very impressed by how efficient everything that's publicly run is in okay. Singapore. And, it, and it, sorry, you, you can also look at like the, the economics, right? You can look at what's the, the state budget as a percentage of GDP and stuff like that. And it's, it's like a half, it's half or a third of European countries. But we could argue that these countries run like a company. Yes. So you're saying it's basically public, but it's run like a company. So it's like, like a private company. Yeah, almost. I mean, it is, it is a democracy, but of course, it's not a democracy that aims to be a Western style democracy. So freedom of speech is not as highly valued. I think you spoke about that with Arthur, actually. I saw your podcast yeah. with him recently. Um, and, and it's similar in a company, right? The companies are also not run, you know, in a democratic fashion. So there, yeah, it exists on some spectrum between like a company and a full fledged kind of completely open democracy. What do you not like about Singapore? 
Is there anything? Yeah, I, there are a few things. Obviously, I think it would be better if you had four seasons. Mm -hmm. You can't change <laughs> that, uh, which is kind of sad. Like that is fundamentally one of the things you just can't change. Um, I, I do like the weather, but I think you lose a sense of time when you don't have four seasons, Absolutely. which is not great. Yeah, we don't know. Like, is it January? Like, if, for me, it's all the time like that. Is it January? Is it summer? I, I yeah, don't know. Is yeah, it exactly. like September? No yeah. idea. Ah, okay, it's exactly. only Jan. Fine. <laughs> exactly. So that's uh, that's kind of frustrating. Um, I mean, obviously, housing is not cheap, but you have to look at that in the context of um, the taxes you pay too. So you have to look at your kind of collect your total spend, mm -hmm. and I think it still works out better. It depends on many factors, of course, and how you live and things like that. So we talked, I mean, you just mentioned housing, but we also talked before uh, on the elevator about another podcast about real estate. And and for me, I'd like to put this in context with um, investing, the theme of investing mm. in general for millennials and Gen Z. Because mm. I know, I mean, from what I read on Twitter, that you have a kind of like a different view than what we can read in, you know, sort of uh, timeless principle investing books, which is usually, you know, you invest in your stocks and your bond, and then real estate is really good, mm. is a great investment, right? Mm. So how do you think that millennials and Gen Z should approach investing today? Mm. Yeah, this is a difficult question. So I think if you go back to first principles on real estate, there are certain things that are changing now versus how it's been in the last, say, 200 years or thousands of years. Uh, population growth is probably the primary one. And if you think of just supply and demand, as people have less children and as populations age, I think that it will have a severe impact on the demand for housing. I mean, that's just, that doesn't feel very controversial if you just think mm. think it through. The The other thing is... Just, just one thing mm, regarding that. There's still a lot of people, for example, you read Elon Musk on Twitter, he's like, it's a disaster. We don't have enough kids, right? Mm. We're not reproducing at a fast pace enough mm. for it to be sustainable for our human species and like the GDP growth and everything. But you still have a lot of people that have this kind of almost false view of, of there is too many people uh, yeah, everywhere. Sense. It's not sustainable, right? So what would you tell these people? Obviously, like you have your own view and... You know, in relationship with real estate, but in general, right? Yeah. What do you What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm a technology optimist, so I think it doesn't make sense to be focused on us. Like, I think there's plenty of space in the universe for sure, right? Uh, and even on Earth, if you can develop certain new technologies with regards to energy consumption, food, and so on, I don't see why we couldn't keep growing substantially as a human race. I mean, it just seems a little bit silly to me that we just happen to be at the max right now. Um, but yeah, it does require innovation. It does require new technological solutions that people have to create. Uh, I don't, I would, you know, I wouldn't advise anyone to hold back on having kids by any means. Like, I don't think that makes sense. It's also uh, just from a human race perspective, right? That's that's quite depressing, a depressing thought if you don't procreate. Like that's, I, I personally think about this quite a bit in terms of, you know, when I was in my 20s, should I have children and so on? And I, I kind of landed at this point where, look, I have, you know, arguably, depending on how you look at it, millions of years of ancestors before me in history, they all struggle to survive and uh, procreate. And it would be kind of silly if it just stops with me because, nah, I don't feel like it. I feel like I kind of owe, <laughs> owe it to my, my ancestors to keep the, you know, keep the lineage going. So should I be selfish or should I think about the greater civilization, right? But who are you helping if you stop having kids? I completely agree with you. Mm. And I also think, by the way, like that, that it's not worth living if you don't have kids. Like, I don't even know why we're here if we don't have kids at some point. But, but... But now let's put this again, topic of investing and actually the fact that everything becomes so expensive mm. everywhere, which is why, I mean, Bitcoin, you know, asset price inflation, money printing, mm. all that stuff. But it makes life much harder for the average 
millennial for sure to actually make enough money to just you know like i'm not even thinking about the family i'm like hey i'm trying to survive here like i can't even buy a house anymore it's too expensive yeah so how do i navigate that yeah with well, my it, yeah i think like first of all you have to just understand kind of the structural reasons why this happens and it's all supply and demand right uh one of the reasons, maybe the main reason why housing prices uh, continue to go up so much <laughs> is because uh, there are many forces preventing the creation of new housing, right? If you, the one way to get housing prices to, be, to come down is to increase supply. Mm. Like that's just basic economics, right? And then what are the forces that are preventing the increase of supply? One is nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. People who say, look, people can build new houses, but I don't want to have it in my neighborhood. I don't want the construction noise. I like my little forest next to my house or whatever it is, right? So don't touch that. Okay, if everyone thinks like that, you will never have any new housing. And then you have a scarce and kind of artificially scarce supply of housing. That's like the, the, the first part. The second part is you have so many politicians who, again, don't understand either economics or secondary effects of their actions. So... If you introduce something like rent control, what is the ultimate effect of that? If you have rent control, you make it either less profitable or in some cases not economical at all to develop new housing, mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to lose money as a landlord in, in some cases. So, so, so why would you then buy and then why would the developer then create the new housing, right? So... Uh, rent control is an example of something that basically inhibits the creation of new housing supply. And so you have all these forces that are effectively keeping supply down on housing. And, you know, Singapore is kind of an unusual place because it's so small. Mm. But even in Singapore, I feel like they're managing the housing supply much better than in many European countries. Or especially in, like in the US, they have a ton of real estate. Like if you just think of the land of the whole country, obviously. So if everyone is complaining about rents going up like crazy, you think that one of the solutions would be let these rent go up like crazy. Short term is going to be painful, but longer term, this is going to incentivize more I, developers. This, to yeah, I mean, like, I think I don't think I wouldn't say just let rent go up crazy. I would say make it easier to create more housing. Mm. Like that's where you need to focus. But I'll give you kind of an example of the... Uh, the wrong way to do it, which, you know, I, I'm from Norway. And of course, in Norway, as many other countries, they say, you know, it's too expensive for young people to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you have a maybe 20% kind of down payment requirement from the bank if you want to get a mortgage? And then some people are saying, actually, we should remove that. You should ha not have to have any cash up front. Let's make it 0%. You could borrow the whole amount. But what does that mean from an economic perspective? That means now everyone has infinite purchasing power or at least higher purchasing power. And what's the effect of that? That means you're going to drive prices up, mm. right? So it doesn't actually solve the problem. <laughs> the thing you have to do is increase supply if you want to uh, decrease or manage the price of housing. Like there's no way around it. If you artificially try to suppress it through price controls and so on, like all of history shows that that just makes the problem worse. Hmm. So I get I get it, right? But now I still have most of my friends in Switzerland or in Singapore in their late 20s or early 30s who whose dream, maybe it's not their own dream, maybe it's what society told them or what they heard from their parents, is to buy real estate, right? Mm. That's the first mm. kind of goal. Why would you tell them? Because I know you sold your real estate, right? In yeah. the last two years, you sold everything. Yeah. And that's not what people typically hear. I mean, I think uh, people should, of course, if they want to get real estate as a consumption good. You know, everyone has, everyone is naturally short real estate because you have to live mm. uh, somewhere, right? So there's no doubt. I'm not saying like real estate is going to get to zero for sure. Of course, people are going to have to live somewhere. Uh, but what I don't think is, uh, I don't think real estate should be seen as like an investment class. I mean, at the end of the day, the market has to decide. And if people want to invest in real estate, they can. And I have many friends, you know, who do that uh, quite actively. Um, 
but I don't think it's great actually for society because of what we just talked about. Mm. Like everyone needs to have a place to live. And if you just drive, like not everyone needs a Bitcoin. And so it's kind of okay if you don't buy it, but everyone needs a house, right? So you kind of need some kind of safety net or some kind of mechanisms to ensure that people can afford housing. Uh, but the thing is, I don't think the solution is more government intervention. Although we live in a place, Singapore, where that has worked pretty well for the local population, I think there are simpler solutions, which is basically to just let people create more housing. And that's the way you manage prices, right? You don't need to mess with the pricing side of the market. That just screws things up. So from an investment perspective, I, I think like maybe to take a step back as well, um, the other part, which is one reason of many reasons that I'm very bullish on crypto is the demographic changes in the world, right? So think about boomers versus millennials, right? Boomers uh, now, many of them, if not most of them, will be retired. And sadly, many of them will be passing away in the next 20 years. And that creates an inheritance wave uh, between 70 to $100 trillion worth of assets are going to be inherited uh, from boomers. Many of them, those assets will go to millennials. Mm -hmm. And then you have to think about these two classes, right? Or two groups of people, millennials versus boomers. What are their investment uh, profiles and what are their preferences? And we buy, you know, cartoon JPEGs, JPEGs I want to do the same and, <laughs> and we buy like Bitcoin or whatever. But the, the point is, we actually have way more alternatives. We have way more options ahead of us. When our parents were saving money, they had, you know, their home and maybe bank deposits. And if they were a little bit adventurous, maybe stocks, mm. right? And then in kind of the more recent years, like index funds and so on. But that wasn't fully mainstream when our parents were young. And so they didn't have any options. And naturally, all of their money went into those few asset classes. So the other part about the real estate story for me and why I'm you know, bearish on it as an investment class on a multi-decade perspective is that I think it just will have way more competition from other asset classes. From digital real estate, basically. Yeah, digital, exactly. I mean, like I mean, like assets. crypto is, yes. for me, is digital real estate. It's yeah. digital assets, right? Mm. And so, yeah, that competition naturally means that, you know, if you're inheriting real estate, many people will choose to sell that real estate. And the question is, does all that money go back into real estate or does it leak, it spill over into crypto and other types of assets? I think it's pretty natural that it would spill over into new assets. And if you look at Gen Z and so on, you know, they're even more plugged into the whole digital ecosystem with like Fortnite skins and you know gaming assets and so on so I, it seems pretty obvious to me that that is not going away that's where the world is headed yeah so basically it's front running the flow of money from boomers to millennials yes and then gen z yeah by saying hey like look people i mean these people will receive these you know 70 to 100 trillion of money yeah and they will invest in another place which for us is pretty obvious yeah, I mean, the thing is, we I don't even need to know where the money goes. I just need to know there are going to be so many options mm. and that creates com competition for yeah. real estate, right? So as, as an asset class. And so, yeah, I think you have some of these like pretty powerful forces that, you know, when you look at it collectively is going to be not great for real estate. And I think the third force is you have to acknowledge that real estate is the only asset class where you can get 5x leverage uh, at a pretty large scale mm. to make investments. And so there's a lot of leverage built in to pr real estate prices. And that does not really, like crypto, of course you can get leverage, but it's it's like uh, it's collateralized, right? Mm. Uh, with, with, uh, so with real estate, you of course collateralize the house itself, but increasingly you can collateralize crypto which means I think there's kind of an interesting effect there where as like collateral, collateralization of crypto assets becomes more po more common and easier and so on, you might get a similar like inflation mm -hmm. in that part of the market that real estate has experienced. Uh, and so there's so much, there's so much like 
leverage built into the real estate market, which means, you know, either you increase the leverage, which is what I was talking about earlier. If you forget the 20% requirement, you make it a 10% requirement. Now you have mm-hmm. 10, 10x leverage. You make it a 5% requirement. Now, yeah, now you have 20x leverage. If you keep doing that, yeah, maybe it can keep growing and the prices will inflate as you build in more and more leverage. But of course, at some point, it gets pretty irresponsible. And you're seeing now the fourth force, let's say, in this uh, kind of total view of real estate, of course, is re- uh, rent interest rates, right? So so that's the other thing where like we have grown up in a world where like you have zero interest rate policy and it's practically been free to borrow money. And so many people who will have bought real estate in the last 5, 10, 15 years, they've like never seen high interest rates before. And now they are starting to feel that, mm-hmm. unfortunately. So that's that's more of a short-term thing, right? But I think all in all, there are so many reasons why I don't think real estate is a great investment class on a multi-decade perspective. I'm not saying it's going to collapse like tomorrow or next year or whatever. But I think if you look back at this in the 2030s, we're going to be like, yeah, clearly what what was happening in the real estate sector was a bubble. So where do you invest your money then? Because you're saying there's so many options, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the natural place, of course, is crypto. But of course, crypto itself is is a very diverse sector at this point. And, you know, just to be very clear, I'm not an investment advisor, right? So <laughs> we're not giving any financial advice. We're just sharing thoughts. I know thoughts where you're going. Loosely. I'm all in crypto. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, but I I do think you know obviously it's 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 a good idea to have some exposure to the basics of crypto. Call it you know Bitcoin, ETH. Maybe you want to look at some other assets. Mm-hmm. And if you if you happen to be interested in it, then you can spend more time on you know cartoon <laughs> JPEGs and all sorts of other things, which has been great for us, by the way, as Penguin Absolutely. holders. Is there anything else that you're looking at beside crypto? For the next five to ten years, I mean, obviously just... companies, right? Like stocks. So, but I, I don't. I think like there's an interesting split between public stocks and private stocks, and increasingly, you're seeing that money is kind of going into the pub, so the private part of of uh, of um, stocks. So. Um, there, there's another kind of related force to what we were talking about before with the regulations and so on and on real estate. You can think about how hard it is to go public now, right? And so you have to, if you think about the 90s, Netscape, right? They went public after I think it was 16 months mm. after they started the company, which is incredible. And that would never happen today because there are so, uh, it's so much more expensive and the regulations basically make it super hard for you to go public. Um, you know, you could argue for some good reasons, but that ultimately means that most retail investors who can access public stocks only, only get access to a company very late in the uh, life cycle of a company. And what is happening with people like you and me and others who are uh, kind of active investors, let's say, is that we manage to invest in private companies, right? And so that seems to be a trend where like everyone is an angel investor. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit myopic because, you know, in crypto, we we tend to do that. Not everyone, of course, will be an angel investor, literally speaking. But that seems to be kind of a trend that's happening where you are uh, investing more in private uh, companies, not public companies. And I would say this is also something that's investing in companies is a good thing for the world, right? That means you're financing new products that can help make the world a better place. You're creating jobs and so on. And so just from, again, like a societal perspective, that seems to be a better thing for the world than if you just, you know, again, I don't want to sound too critical, but if you just speculate on real estate, I don't see how you're kind of helping the world, frankly. Mm. But maybe you could say the same thing about crypto. I was about to say that, actually. Yeah. I was about to yeah. say exactly that. Is and, it better and, to speculate on a and so, on, real, on real estate? It's kind of yeah. like... So maybe I can lay out like the moral 
the moral reason for why I think people should invest in crypto. And I think what we are doing in crypto is we're building the future of finance, right? And the financial system today is broken. Like it has too many middlemen. It has too high fees. There are too many gatekeepers. There's not enough innovation. I mean, just look at the banking sector. Even fintech companies are quite slow and have to raise so much money to overcome lots of hurdles. And so crypto represents the alternative to that, right? You don't have middlemen, or at least you have fewer. You have lower fees in aggregate, depending on how you look at it. But generally speaking, it's much cheaper to send money across the world, for example, with crypto. You have much more innovation and you don't have gatekeepers. It's a permissionless system. But right now, in the beginning of crypto, you also have lots of speculation. But I think the speculation funds the creation of the infrastructure. Absolutely. And so you might look at this and think like, this is nonsense, like Mm. buying meme coins and buying cartoon (laughs) JPEGs and whatnot. But a lot of the infrastructure that gets built will genuinely be used to run the future of finance. And I really mean that, right? Like if you think of NFT infrastructure, again, we think about collateralizing assets and things like that. If you're collateralizing a pudgy penguin today, the same platform in theory could be used to collateralize a real world asset that's represented by an NFT, right? The liquidation mechanisms, all these different things, oracles, like they can work and smart contracts more broadly speaking. So, so I think that's the, that to me is kind of the, the master plan actually. And there's no grand, you know, puppet master in the back orchestrating this, but that's kind of organically what's happening. And it, maybe it's just the story of markets and capitalism where you attract speculation, you attract money, and there's a lot of, you know, fraud, scams, garbage that comes out of that. But some of it is very valuable and is revolutionary for the world. And that's how I see crypto. So I'm totally fine with people speculating mm. and kind of going crazy in the space because I know some of it goes to funding um, really important infrastructure for the future. It's kind of similar to, you know, people who say, oh, why are these people specu- speculating on these meme coins or these JPEGs? Similar to people criticizing space, you know? Like, yeah. why do we build these rockets? It's such a yeah. waste of oh, money. Just billionaires' egos or whatever. Exactly. Right? Yeah. When at the end of the day, okay, you can see the greater vision, which is maybe we go to another planet and we save ourselves from some future bad stuff, but also supersonic planes yeah. and all these technologies that could not potentially exist who doesn't want to go from singapore to new york in two hours yeah who but that's why like the intent in my view shouldn't really matter that much like mm-hmm. if elon musk or jeff bezos are doing this for their own kind of ego trips <laughs> and by the way i'm not saying that's the case but let's assume that's the case yeah does it really matter if it advances human civilization right and on the contrary there are plenty of politicians with at least you know, what they say is that they have noble intentions. You can debate it. But what are the results? Like I said, with rent control and things like that. Well, the intention is, hey, I want to give you cheaper housing. I get that. The intent is good. You might be naive, you know, or corrupt. Like, it depends. But I I get the intent. But the question is, what's the result, right? And this is where, like, I, I don't care if people are speculating with the intent of getting rich and then it funds the future of finance. That's great. Like what matters at the end of the day is, are you actually making the world a better place? Are you creating a future that's exciting that you want to live in? Uh, Or, you know, do you have the noblest of intents, but the end result is you're going to live in some, you know, uh, this dystopian, (laughs) I don't want to use the word socialist, but (laughs) that is kind of the word that's coming to mind. But like a, a society where, uh, nothing works and it's extremely bureaucratic and people can't create, you know, the lives they want to live because everything is decided top down from someone who has a good intention, but doesn't understand secondary effects. Which is the case pretty much everywhere, right? If you think about yeah. countries or even corporations, big corporations, how they yes, run. Yes, but the beautiful thing about corporations is that they can go out of business, mm. right? Cool. That That cool. is the fundamental difference and in theory, countries could collapse, but it rarely happens. Mm. 
um, you know, in the public sector, if something doesn't work, then you give it more money, right? In the private sector, if something doesn't work, then the <laughs> company collapses. Yeah. And then some other company comes in and does a better job, right? I don't want to make this too political, but that's it really, I think it's the reality. Yeah, absolutely. I really love it because there's not many people who really, I mean, I think a lot of people think that way, but they don't really express it because they're mm -hmm. kind of scared of what people think. And like, I've been thinking like that since pretty much forever. And when I discovered Bitcoin, when mm -hmm. I read the Bitcoin standard, I was like, this makes, and, and then the, the, the internet of money. Yeah. I was like, Bitcoin Ethereum makes so much sense because nothing fucking works anywhere. And like, I don't trust the system. And yeah. I'm, I'm not like a, someone who's like, oh yeah, everything is shit. And like, no, it's just, it doesn't work. Like, let's be honest like, yeah, with I mean, ourselves. For, sh for sure. And, and, <laughs> and so, but you know, everything has nuance, right? And I think it's interesting for like people, people like us who, we are from Europe, we're from a different part of the world. Now we live in Singapore. We have seen mm. how things work in different mm. places. And I think the thing that, when I moved to Asia for the first time, I moved to Hong Kong, I was kind of struck by how can you run, uh, I mean, a city state in that, in that case, uh, with such low taxes, like, how is it yeah. even possible? Yeah. Like, how can it just work? And <laughs> Hong you know, Kong first, right? Yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, you can get into like all this, all the things you don't have in Hong Kong in terms of kind of a safety net, welfare, whatnot. But just the fact that you can run, a country with like a third of the income tax and like no tax on capital gains, no wealth tax, all these different things. No, actually no sales tax in Hong Kong either. I find that kind of fascinating. And it, I think it just changed my perspective quite a bit because I've been raised in a country where you never question taxes. Like you never question it. You, you just assume, first of all, you're indoctrinated to never question it. It's like immoral and it's taboo, right? It's it's like you're you're greedy. Only the taxes question. or the actual system in general? Because Switzerland is is that I think is, yeah. is hey like yeah. if you question something, I, I mean Switzerland is great, but like if you question something like how dare you? Yes. <laughs> how dare you? Yeah, no, yeah. So I mean I what I think people tend to not question is uh, is this the most effective way to get the results you, you want? And, and that's where I think there's a very slippery slope where the intent comes back. It's like, hey, you know, we pay a lot of taxes, but we have great safety net. Mm -hmm. We have free, you know, higher education, all these different things. But if you actually did the accounting, which I think very few people do, and you break it down and you say, hey, if I just took all the money I spent here and I would spend it privately, uh, that's then you you will probably have a very large budget to spend on like healthcare yes. if you if you carve that out. And of course, there's the redistribution effect of taxes. Of course, that you have to factor that in too. And that is a real thing. Like you have to do that, I think, in a society, some way or another. But I think the the thing that so one thing is, you know, do people question the effectiveness of that system and like maybe you could get equal or better results but with a way lower bill mm. for the taxpayers collectively uh, that's the one thing and i think um the the other thing is just generally uh very little uh interest in um carving like reducing spending there's like an incentives problem in government where no one wants to reduce spending like why would you reduce spending right there's there's no incentive to it you're always incentivized to grow your your team your department whatever there is literally no incentive to ever cut and even ministers will kind of compete to get the biggest chunk of the budget mm. right so there is literally no incentive to cut it What's really interesting, I mean, here you're talking about taxes, but again, if you think about the Swiss mindset and I look at my parents, who I love, by the way, but like, I'm not even talking about taxes or government, I'm talking about banks, right? Yeah. How do you justify these freaking fees? I mean, now with crypto, I kind of like educated them. So like they start to be like, oh, no. And they would, the very Swiss ways, you don't question a banker or mm -hmm. a lawyer. That's right? interesting. Yeah. And 
you need to pay fees for this person to be earned because they have a suit. Their bread, right? They have a suit. Exactly. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't need to pay that much fees because this dude doesn't need an Audi R8 yeah. or a freaking mega houses or an amazing suit to come to see you to impress you. No, 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 no. Like that's not the way to think about it, right? Mm, mm, mm. And so think about that. I have a specific bank in my mind, which is still, I mean, the biggest bank of Switzerland, which is still alive today. Yeah. And they're banker. And I've been since years like Bitcoin, Bitcoin, ETH, blah, blah, blah. And I was always, I mean, they, they, they jumped in like a few years ago, my parents and my sister. But still, I was always like poking and being like, hey, your banker, like we'll give all these fees to and like talk to him about Bitcoin. And he's always, oh, no, no, since you're, oh, it's horrible. It's just, it's scary. It's scam. It's dangerous. Blah, blah. And now something happened two weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. With the Bitcoin ETF. With the ETFs, yeah. And I told them. I was on holidays uh, in the so in three weeks. Completely. I told him, I was like, within six months, yeah. this man whose name starts with a P <laughs> <laughs> is going to come to you and sell you this. Thing. Yeah. That's the thing about the ETF, right? If you just think about it too, suddenly <laughs> all of TradFi is incentivized to do marketing for Bitcoin. Shield which is bags. kind of incredible, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, you, it's such an amazing plot. If you just think about it, how you would, how did this happen? It's like brilliant. Like who engineered this plan? It's it's a genius plan. Do you think there is a negative side of like having a Bitcoin ETF and going more mainstream for the industry? I think all in all, no, not really. I think generally you want this to go mainstream. Um, Maybe the negative part would be if too if too large of a portion makes it into these ETFs, so that somehow disproportionately they get power. I don't know. That's maybe more of a risk with ETH because you have you know ETH staking the yield mm. and validate validators. With Bitcoin, is a bit more separated because you have miners, right? So that's separate from the whole you know holding of the asset. Um. I think my, you can you can probably place people on kind of a scale of are you kind of a sort of ideological maximalist when it comes to crypto where you will be uncompromising on many different things like decentralization and so on uh, or you could be more of a pragmatist where the the goal is really to just get this out to as many people as possible mm -hmm. and I think generally I fall more in the camp of the pragmatist and I think those virtues of decentralization and so on are important and you should be weighing them and sort of gauging them how you're trading off different things over time but mm. generally speaking i think it's a good thing to just get new avenues and a larger surface area for crypto in the world yeah and more money and more big brains to work on like making this infrastructure work because now they depend on it for example yes. if blackrock blackrock needs bitcoin to work right if they sell these products yeah. with their clients. And if it gets a large enough like revenue stream for them, yeah, then they do start like quite literally depending on it, yeah. right? To pay their staff yeah. and whatnot. Uh, but I mean, we're very far from there still. Um, but yeah, it, it is really interesting. I think, um, you know, it, there are many, there are many things happening in crypto this year that I think are quite positive for the industry. We had a disastrous, you know, 18 months or so I think last time I was on this podcast might have been like uh, right in the middle of it or it was shortly Jan after. Jan 2023, Three. two months after FTX. And I remembered yeah. I, was, I, went, I was a big believer because like I'm going to start pushing this podcast and do other things. But I was dead inside because I yeah. got so wrecked on Luna and other few things. And at the end, you kind of have jokingly said, we're all going to make it. So you were like pretty chill mm. and like very optimistic about the future, right? Even if it was mm. a terrible time. Yeah, I mean, and <laughs> like, frankly, 2023 was not great for, mm. I think, most crypto companies. And actually, many crypto investors, though, it was not bad for because prices went up. Mm. But there's a lagging effect on the companies, right? And if you read Coinbase's, you know, quarterly results and so on, uh, it does take a bit of time for them to build up that, like, revenue base and so on. Uh, and same thing with lots of other crypto companies, especially like infrastructure providers who are kind of the secondary beneficiaries of all the trading. Uh, this year, though, I think things are quite different. The ETFs obviously was a great way to start the year. 
uh, we have to, uh, though, see what the effect is over time. And to your point earlier, in six months, this person is going to come in and, you know, in the bank, come and shill Bitcoin to your parents or whatever. Uh, things take time in TradFi. So it's not like we can expect just to switch on all of these like marketing and go to market efforts from the banks and the TradFi firms. But I think over the year, I can't see how it won't just ramp up, you know, in that sector. Absolutely. Then you have the halving, of course. You very likely will have an Ethereum ETF as well. And then that kind of opens the door to more ETFs. I wanted to ask, do you think there is other, I mean, Ethereum ETF, we had a Larry thing the other day, kind of like talking about tokenizing everything and everything. Yeah. Do you think that it's possible this cycle we have not only Bitcoin and ETH uh, ETF, but others like Solana or whatever? I think it's possible for sure. I think it's possible. Okay. Like I don't have a strong view on it. Mm. Uh, I do think Bitcoin and like Bitcoin is in a class of its own, but then ETH is also, I think quite clearly one, one head above the rest in terms of how people think about it how long it's been around, et cetera. So I don't think it's an automatic, you know, ETH ETF and then sole ETF the next week. I don't think that's going to happen, but it naturally opens the door to more assets. You kind of go from like, you know, monotheism to polytheism, mm. right? You kind of open the door to that. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of assets there to go into. Another big thing for the crypto space that happened this year is Nansen 2. Yes. Yeah. Or last year, technically, like we launched it last year and then it started really taking off in 2024. Uh, yeah, that's been, that's been cool. I mean, in that sense, 2023 was also a builder's year. Yeah. Right. There was, uh, and you could argue 2022 to some extent, although it was very disruptive for builders too, when uh, you see FTX and Terra and all this stuff. In 2023, you didn't have that many dramatic incidents. You mostly had companies saying like, let's get back to building and get really hardcore on improving our products. And that's what we did at Nansen, right? We had to make some difficult decisions in terms of focusing more reducing our surface area because we had ex expanded our vision quite dramatically um, in a short amount of time. And we had to pull that back and think like, where are we uniquely good as a company? Where do we create the most value? Let's do more of that. And I think Nansen 2 is uh, a great example of that. We also had some legacy issues that many small and large tech companies go through where it's hard to just build on the code base you have and you onboard new people, those new people are like, this code base is super difficult to work with. And so with Nonsense 2, the initial motivation to do it was actually just to make it, create a code base that was easier to work with. So we had higher uh, product velocity, that like we could ship features faster. Mm -hmm. That was actually the initial motivation. So starting from scratch, a new code yeah, base? We, we, yeah, we built the whole thing from the ground up. You said that the goal was to do that every year? Is it correct or uh, not? I don't know if I said that. I don't, and I don't know if you should do that every year. I don't think you should do that every year, actually. Uh, but we had to do it mm. um, for many different reasons. Um, so the whole thing is built from the ground up, which first of all means we can ship new things faster, which is needed in crypto. You need to move very fast. And mm. speed is literally one of our values, although I don't think we were living up to it that well in 2022. I think that's now changing. The other part was we literally have made the product itself like a hundred times faster. So if you're a user and you just want to get the answer to your question, both in terms of the navigation, you can just smash command K and write, you know, little pudgies or whatever mm. you want. And you're taken to the right dashboard. Mm. You don't have to like, do I go to NFT God mode? Do I go to wallet profiler? We just know where you want to go based on your input. Okay, it sounds kind of obvious, but that was not the case in Nansen 1. So the path is much shorter from question to answer. And then the literal performance of the database that powers these queries uh, is, has, is a different technology. <clears throat> and so it is 100 times faster to just get the loading of whatever you're looking at, which is a huge benefit. And then we've also added several, I think, very innovative features that make the whole product more personalized and makes it feel more streamlined. For example? So we have this feature called Smart Segments, mm -hmm. where 
you know, historically people know Nansen for our ability to label wallets. Mm -hmm. And this is still something we're the best at. We have more than 300 million addresses labeled across lots of different chains. And now, though, we have created this functionality where you can decide your own criteria. Like, let's say you wanted to monitor everyone who has made, I don't know, 10 ETH on Bored Apes. You can drag and drop like, or select some filters very quickly and you configure that, you know, traded token, board ape, profit, 10 ETH, boom. And then it loads instantly a segment of wallets. And you can now save that segment and say board ape profiteers or something mm -hmm. like that. You can also do the opposite who lost money on board apes or whatever. And we're adding more and more criteria for that. And you can then create these different segments that you can, first of all, you can profile the segment. So what other things do those wallets hold today? Right. So that's kind of your own smart money or your own segment of wallets that you want to track. And then you can bring those segments into the rest of the product and filter and set alerts and things like that for it. So it, it just allows you to customize things much more, but you don't have to code. And it's super snappy to set it up. So that's one example. We also have a feature called signals where you don't have to, because many people feel like they go to announce and they need to have like a thesis. They need to know what they're looking for. Mm. And what you can do with signals is literally a feed that just surfaces anomalous events on chain. Very smart. Right? So, hey, this token has like 500 times the amount of inflow to centralized exchanges than it's ever had. Like, what's going on there? Well, let's take a look. So we surface that for you. And you can even filter within that signals feed. Do you care about NFTs? Do you care about tokens? Do you care about smart money? Do you care about exchanges? Like, what do you care about? And you can personalize that signals feed. Uh, it's also AI driven, which is cool. And we're making more, to, yeah. we're adding more AI features this uh, this uh, year, which is pretty exciting. And we, we should talk about AI as well, because I've spent a lot of time on it. We will, we will. Mm. There's, a, there's a part we added to this podcast, which is called basically Crypto Alpha. Yeah. It's because that's what people want on Twitter, you know, some concrete alpha. Yeah. And I think there is a good link between Nansen, Nansen 2, and Alpha. Yes. So the, 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 the first question would be, why should people sign up for Nansen 2? Yeah. And can you give some personal, you already did it last time, some personal examples of coins or NFTs that you managed to spot yeah. on the early thanks to Nansen? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. So when we started Nansen 2, when we launched it, I actually spun up a new wallet and funded it and said, let me just buy stuff I discover in mm -hmm. Nansen 2 and see how it goes. And in about two weeks, I ha had made more money on that portfolio. Actually, I think I doubled the amount of money I needed to pay for a professional subscription for a year. Mm. Now, that doesn't happen with everyone. I can't guarantee that's going to happen with everyone. But uh, some of the coins that I discovered through that um, were, I think, what were they? There was one, Cypher was one of them. I already knew about this one, but it came up in my feed because I saw other uh, wallets uh, that had been accumulating a position in the past buying even more. So that's one example where you can see on chain what people are actually doing. So people talk about stuff on Twitter, but you don't know how many of them are like bots or LARPers or whatever. Mm. On chain, you see what people actually do. Mm. So yes, you can talk the talk, but do you walk the walk? That's what you see on chain. So that is a fundamental pr principle, I think, is why people sign up for Nansen. The challenge with on chain is that there's so much stuff going on. So you need some way to curate and surface the signal in all of it. Yeah. And that's what we do. That's that's literally what the company has been created to do to surface the signal. So uh, Cypher is one of the coins. I knew about it. I was originally uh, an angel investor in it. And after seeing um, what was happening on chain, I decided and seeing frankly, some of the top holders that were accumulating a position, because some of the funds I don't know, you can actually see an Nelson, it's uh, CMT Digital mm. had accumulated like an 8% of all the supply. 
throughout the bear market for that coin. Um, yeah, so that's that's one example. Uh, there were a few other ones I looked at as well. Uh, RBX, I think was one that I hadn't really heard of before. And in hindsight, when I looked at Twitter, people had been talking about it. Uh, and because I saw smart money buying it, I bought it and basically it went up. I think it went up 50 or 60% after that. Again, this doesn't always happen. There are no guarantees. Uh, but these are examples of, of coins that kept coming up as I was uh, using it. And then, if, then there were some coins as well that I bought that went down. And uh, what I did was I, you know, sold the losers and I kept the winners, which is, I think, the opposite of what many people do. Uh, you tend to sell the winners because you want to take yeah. profits and you hope that the losers are going to come back. Yeah, which barely which, works. <laughs> which doesn't happen very often. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the reason people just sign up, I mean... If you don't know what's happening on chain and you're investing in crypto, then I think you have a serious disadvantage. It's not going to give you everything you need because there's more stuff happening around you in the world that's, you know, valuable information than just on chain. But it is a must have, like it's a necessity, but it's not sufficient in terms of doing investing in crypto. crypto. So I would say like on-chain and your social network are the two Absolutely. most important information sources. And you can refine both of them. You should actually spend time getting better at uh, digesting information from both of those two channels. The qualitative social network, curate the people around you, speak, yeah. who you speak with, who you take input from. And then for on-chain get good at actually reading on chain with the right tools, right? And there are people who use like Etherscan quite uh, proficiently. Uh, it's not really built for alpha. It's more like a reference product. Um, but, you know, if you have the time to do that, uh, you can. But what we've seen is when people invest, say, full time, they tend to save a lot of time by using Nonsense because of all the features that are built specifically around investing. And because we have a particular focus on surfacing the signal, not just to give you kind of a blockchain explorer where you can see everything that's going on. Let's continue with some crypto alpha. Um, yeah, let me just think about the... I feel like I should always bring some alpha into a meeting, but I never do. And I have to like come up with, on the spot with it. Uh, I, I mean, but Cypher is probably the, the main one. Probably. You even told me last time, and it was not Nansen too, but Nansen helped you get very, I think it was, it was it Bored Ape? Yeah. But then you, I mean, you had a lot. I sold and, all of them. And then you sold all of them, yes. right? Yeah. Did Nansen help you find Pudgy Penguins? Um, What was the story with Pudgy Penguins? Yeah. That made you, because you probably receive a million advisory roles, offers a day or a week, right? What's the story? Mm. What's your story with Pudgy Penguins? Because you mm. were really early on. Yeah. And... Why did you decide to accept being an advisor? And what was really special about that kind of community and project back yeah. then? So the backstory on Pudgy is <clears throat> my friend Tom, who works at Dragonfly. We used to work together at Zero X uh, in 2019. And so my friend Tom saw a tweet about a CryptoPunks billboard in San Francisco. Mm. And he made this snarky tweet where he said, look, I'm just going to say it. No one's ever going to put pudgy penguins on a billboard. And I saw that and I was like, and then I saw the pudgy penguins and I thought they look kind of cute. <laughs> and so I thought someone should put pudgy penguins on a billboard. And I ended up in a telegram group with some people who were pudgy penguins holders. And they were hilarious, frankly. And I said, look, we should, uh, how do we make this happen? And long story short, some people in that group managed to get Pudgy Penguins on a billboard in KL, in Malaysia, yeah. in the center of the city <laughs> during COVID. So no one was there and advertising was very cheap, <laughs> but it made yeah. for a very good, um, you know, some good content in terms of like filming it and so yeah. on. And it was kind of a first community win for Pudgy Penguins, if you will. And then from there, I started seeing some parallels to other successful projects 
I had invested in or that I had, you know, spent time with. For example? Axie Infinity was the primary one. The parallels. Yes. And there were some parallels that actually, to me, were very obvious uh, that I think now people are going to go back and say, yes, they were obvious, like given the price action, all that stuff that's been happening. But first of all, the IP is very cute. Mm. And I think cuteness is actually extremely valuable. It's like a very intrinsic and universal thing. So the IP is cute, uh, both Axie and I think I would argue Pudgy even cuter. The second part is the community. And Axie, I don't know if people know this, but they had a very hardened community in say 2019 before everything you know started going super crazy. And people were very engaged with that whole community, playing the economics of it, the kind of organic scholars that were popping up, people kind of l sort of leasing out their axes and other people playing the game with their axes. So there was this very strong community around it. And similarly, Pudgy Penguins was getting this very organic and strong community. And, you know, with everything that happened um, with Pudgy Penguins, that community proved to be very resilient. Right. Is, this, is this pre Luca takeover? Yeah, exactly. So wow, this was okay. so this was like, you know, you're seeing the signs of a strong community, but it wasn't fully formed and hadn't gone through that many trials yet. Then the whole thing <laughs> happened with the the rogs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they put fishing rods in our eggs. We, is kind of the meme, right? There was like this egg. People don't know what's in it. Everyone thinks it's going to be a cute little pudgy, which I think came later. And then you open the egg and it's a fishing rod and it made absolutely no sense. And I think that became like a crisis <laughs> in the community <laughs> in terms of the leadership. They thought, what the hell are these guys doing? This makes absolutely no sense. And in hindsight, it kind of became part of the lore because mm. it was so funny and silly. But uh, many people then stepped up and said uh, that they wanted to buy out the whole project and take over the project. And the one who was successful in the end was Luca. And so this added a uh, third C to, you know, we have cute, we have community, and I have a CEO yeah. as well. So there's a third C that comes in there. And frankly, Luca is an incredible leader. He is so inspiring. He's a visionary and he's a real hustler. Like he's a, he's kind of, it's a bit unusual, I think, in the venture startup tech sector to see someone who has this kind of hustle energy. I mean, startup founders are often more kind of, they are visionary, they're technical. You think in, you know, very big terms, like, you know, high, how high is up is kind of the sort of VC way of thinking about how big can this be. Mm -hmm. But he is more like a scrappy hustler kind of guy. And he has a track record of running businesses, making lots of money, selling them and so on. And he's very young. Mm -hmm. Uh, he also he also I think has very good values and you know is has high integrity. But these things I kind of learned over time. I didn't know that immediately, but you know he is a big portion of why I have been and and I'm still very bullish on Budget Penguins as a community as a project. There is a fourth C two which is the content. So this is the thing Absolutely. that he saw that. Yeah as the CEO, I think was one of the great calls he made is like the content is really good. The IP is really strong. That's the thing that's super valuable. How do you just create more content? And he and the rest of the team dominated Giphy with Pudgy Penguin GIFs. And it's the most obvious play in the world <laughs> in hindsight, <clears throat> but they have like billions of views billions on of Giphy. Views. Yeah. And people just use Pudgy Penguin's gifts. And Without it knowing it's freaking Pudgy Penguin. Exactly. Like literally on Teams, on yeah. WhatsApp, everywhere. They don't yeah. need to know it's an <laughs> NFT. Why would you need to know it's an NFT? It's just a cute penguin. And then they also, of course, have the largest Instagram of any NFT collection. Yeah. More than a million followers. So they really nailed the content piece. And by the way, the Instagram profile has a very different content strategy than most NFT collections would have, right? It's focused on mental health Absolutely. in a very positive way yeah. and so on and so forth. That's why and it then, goes so viral. Like, like. Yeah. And and so I think um, they also, because he was so good at doing business and thinking about how do you get revenue and things like that, they were able to roll out the toys and the plushies and all that stuff. 
And I think he realized that like, look, you bootstrap a business from this community. You don't extract the value from the community, which is what many NFT collections actually do, right? Through like royalties or, you know, just selling more, you know, diluting your collection, like the Azuki's elementals is like the canonical example of that. In my view, you just dilute the, the original holders and you actually dilute your community, which mm -hmm. I don't think is a good thing. And so he saw this as an opportunity to go outside of the NFT bubble into a much broader mainstream market and sell toys, get the IP out there and do licensing deals, which I think he's going to crush it at like mm -hmm. over time. Build a, build a real business, essentially. Yeah, he built a real business, yeah. Or in NFT, like, not, yeah. it's not a big thing, right? Yes. <laughs> like, and so, so I think, like, <laughs> Luca is the type of person who makes me very bullish on the Gen Z generation, mm. actually. Uh, I think they, the, like, Gen Z, they kind of get a lot of heat uh, and they get ridiculed. But there are some people who are just incredible yeah. founders, like Mr. Beast, you know, Absolutely. as another example. Yeah. Just unbelievable <laughs> entrepreneurs. And... So hardworking, so smart, so creative. And uh, anyway, so that's kind of how I ended up um, the, the the journey more or less on Pudgy Penguins. And then he asked me to be an advisor because I'd, you know, supported the the project over time and, you know, helped him a bit with a fundraise. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it's amazing to see this, you know, this vision that that he had come to reality and to see all the work that people have put into that project come to fruition. I usually don't like to talk about prices on this podcast because I like to do like sort of timeless, non-shilling mm. interviews. But you tweeted, <laughs> I love so much. You tweeted 10k per ETH, 100 ETH per penguin, ice cold mathematics, <laughs> <laughs> which means I mean obviously you're a bit, a bit memeing here, but like which means a million US dollar per penguin. Yeah. What's your rational? If yeah. there is this any... is my like Balaji pr prediction, right? Uh, yeah, no, um, it's not very mathematically based. <laughs> I just think that they can reach. That's I, I. If you break down the two components, do I think pudgy penguins can reach a hundred ETH? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Do I believe ETH can reach ten thousand? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's just like simple sort of heuristics that make sense. You look at what. Uh, Board apes or crypto punks previous cycle and like how yeah. pudgies yeah it's yeah so it's like actually sometimes <laughs> you 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 decompose something and it's like do these assumptions separately make sense yes and you put them together and you put them together well it's the conclusion right that's why <laughs> I said it's mathematics <laughs> and so who knows if you'll get there again you know do your own research but what I do know is that the holders. And the community of Pudgy Penguins is, is so hardened. It's insane. It's so resilient. It's gone through so much shit. And it's been attracting, and you're probably a big part of that, or at least a certain part of that, the biggest community of builders in the space. Like That's right. All, for me, one of the key things was like, okay, should I buy a, a Pudgy? And I mean, at the same time... Did I influence you to buy a Pudgy? Or? Absolutely. Okay, good. Absolutely. Yeah. And... And uh, I think Kevin from Gojek, he yeah. told me, ah, Alex told I, me to buy a, a I Pudgy. And I was like, one for I'm him. like, the co-founder of Gojek buys a Pudgy. <laughs> Alex has a Pudgy. <laughs> then I'm like, I look at a Layer Zero co-founder, a bunch of people like Pudgy, Pudgy, yeah, Pudgy, but it's kind of like, right? Yeah. Igluminati. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Igluminati. So basically, then I'm like, Mm, interesting. Then Luca comes on the podcast. I'm like, fuck, man, the guy is really next level. I mean, yeah, I was, you get very bullish when you meet him, right? Like he directly. is very inspiring. And then, and then you need to Bobby from CoinGeek. I mean, basically, yeah. every, and now everyone, now everyone is going crazy on that. But even yes. before, yes. if you're on the lookout six months ago, eight months ago, yeah. the key builders in the space, yep. Pudgy, Penguin, P PFP, like, so it was all there yes. in plain sight, right? That's right. How? Except, I mean, maybe with some of your help, but like, how did this happen that most of the biggest builders, which means, by the way, these people, first, they're builders, so they're going to support the founder. Second, they have money, so they're not, they're less likely to sell, right? Yeah. How is it possible that the community is so strong well, a lot of it, everyone? A lot of it. I mean, it comes down to some of those fundamentals, like I was saying before, you know, the cute IP, the community and so on. But you also just have to hustle. You know, mm -hmm. like the stuff we just talked about now, like you, you handpick a pudgy for 
the Deal CEO. I don't know if you know Deal. It's the fastest growing SaaS company in history. Uh, it's basically like an HR platform. Alex, I handpicked a budget for him and he bought it. And he presumably still has it. And he might have bought it a few more. I don't know. Uh, Kevin Gojek yep. handpicked it for him. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then I've just spoken to people and you try to kind of create this, you're creating a community, right? That's the thing which is kind of interesting with crypto that the asset and the community are one Absolutely. in a way, which is kind of an interesting thing, right? Where every, every token is a community. Which is good and bad because you can create these echo chambers. Yes. That sometimes, you know, a Celsius or a Luna, all these things. Like it's not that is true, yes, for sure. But, but, but for something know, yeah. that fundamentally, like, you know, the only value in a pudgy penguin, I mean, you could sort of come up with some thesis around we're going to get X amount of airdrops in the future. That's like a future cash flow. Uh, but if you just think about it, there are no promises mm. based on your pudgy penguins NFT. Mm. It is just a cute penguin. And that's it. So there is no, <laughs> there is no scam that can happen. Yeah. Because it is. There's no it, promise. It, there yeah. is no promise in yeah. a way, right? You can think about the roadmap and all the different things happening, but at the end of the day, you know, you're not owed a dividends or like, well, a cash flow or anything like that, right? So, um, then in a way, if you're just honest with people about that, and you're not like selling them something that won't come to fruition or that might fail. Uh, you're just selling them on like, look, this is a great community and the token is the community. Mm. And frankly, it is, I, I jokingly said, you know, Illuminati, but there is a bit of an effect to that. You know, you you connect with someone on Twitter or whatever, they have a pudgy, you kind of like them a little bit more. Mm. And you're maybe, a, you know, twice as likely to respond to a DM mm. or whatever it is. Uh, and that's cool. You don't know, you know, their gender, their nationality, their ethnicity. You don't know anything about them, but they have a pudgy penguin and it's totally meritocratic in a way, which yep. is kind of cool. Yeah. Another project, I know you're pretty large holder of, and you're probably very bullish on is Lido. You talk about it, especially you say, it's, I mean, it's an amazing project because it mm. generates a lot of fees and it's one, actually one of the few protocols that is like really profitable, Yeah. but yet kind of gets a lot of hate because of the price, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's I don't have a view. Lido? I don't have a strong view actually on like the price of the token. Um, I think there are two applications in the blockchain space that very clearly stand out from the rest in terms of usage. The first one is Uniswap. Mm. Uh, and the second one is Lido. Uh, and if you just look at, of course, the, these are very different applications solving two completely different problems. But Lido solves a very clear problem. You want to, you want to stake ETH, but you don't want to run a validator. You don't want to run, do the hassle of that. Well, then Lido is there to help you with it. Mm. And you get yields, you basically delegate or outsource the running of the validator to a network and you get some yields and you have to pay something for those yields uh, as a fee, which I think most people are fine with. Yep. And it has an incredible liquidity moat. Um, actually, this is a little bit less relevant after you could uh, exit uh, staking natively, but it used to have a really good liquidity moat in terms of um, because the, the liquidity pools were so deep, if you staked ETH through Lido and then you sold your ST ETH, you'd practically get, you know, not lose any money yeah. or very little. Now you can, of course, just exit, right? So that, and then you could argue the moat is, is, is not as strong. But it, I think it has a very, the other part actually, it's interesting when you think about moats for these types of applications, because in theory, you wouldn't expect that they have much moats because they're like open source, anyone can just fork them and whatnot. But often it comes down to like liquidity and brand. 
And I think both of those are present in Uniswap and Lido. Brand is a huge thing, Absolutely. actually. Like trust, but also just top of mind. Like, hey, you need to go and buy something. Where do you go? Many people go to Uniswap, even if theoretically they might be better off going to an, an exchange, a DEX aggregator. They still just go to Uniswap. Um, and I think Lido too, if you want to stake ETH, you you know like that's what most people do, so you can probably trust it mm. and so on, right? And so it has a huge market share, enormous, like so big that people were, many people hate it because it has such yeah. a big market share. You know, it uh, it's hated for its success. Um, of course, the, I think other sector where you could argue, like OpenSea for a long time was up there with Uniswap in terms of usage. With NFTs cooling down and also the NFT category becoming much more competitive, I think it's less clear that they are, you know, at the very top echelon of applications. I personally love OpenSea. I think it's a great product. Uh, but of course, Blur and other products have popped up to give it a run for its money. Uh, but so Uniswap and Lido feel very untouchable. Mm. Yeah, but going back to the token and the price and how it's hated, I mean, you could maybe say something similar about the Uniswap token too, mm. right? That seems kind of disconnected from the success of the pro project. Although, if you scroll from CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap from top to bottom market cap, there aren't that many applications that have their tokens like in the top 50. Mostly it's L1s. Protocols, yeah. It's mostly yeah. L1, uh, L1s and some L2s like Arb and Optimism, but large, like I guess, 85 to 90 to 95 percent will be actually just chains right yeah if you just which is kind of interesting so you mentioned that the the l1s are kind of more likely to be in the top 50. i mean they and th that's just the reality right now exactly yeah and we also talked about uniswap or lido that the project at the end of the day could be amazing but it's more going to be it might, it, it's less likely to be liked if the token price doesn't do well, right? Because the, your token price is your best marketing. That's what we always right. often... Yeah, it's and, weird, right? I don't know exactly why it hasn't performed better. It's, it's a bit odd in a way. Uh, but maybe it comes down to, you know, what your expectations are, right? It do, And it doesn't have... It's not a good, like, meme. It, it's not a token that has... This, think of Chainlink. That's like the canonical, you know, token <laughs> that has incredible yeah. memes, yeah. an yeah. incredible yeah. community. Um, and you almost like, and, and I'm not, and by the way, I'm not saying like it doesn't have fundamentals or anything like that, right? But it's almost like you don't need to care about the fundamentals because mm. it has such a strong community and memes and whatnot. Like Lido has none of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like... It's boring. It's boring. It, it works, it makes money, and it's boring. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's right. It's it's <laughs> very boring, actually. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I haven't seen a single Lido meme, I yeah. think, yeah. <laughs> ever, which is kind of absurd if you think about it, right? I it's don't true. think I've ever seen a Lido meme. So it's maybe true. this is one reason it's hated, too. It's <laughs> almost like the memes are that the price never goes up. Right? <laughs> I wanted to say that. Yeah. Exactly. I was like, probably yeah. the meme is going to be that the price doesn't move. That's So, so there's a narrative problem. Similarly with yeah. Uniswap. I think Uniswap also has no, there's no like memes or about the token, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. You know, there are memes about people trading shit coins on Uniswap, but like the token itself, I don't think it has that. Another one that, I mean, has a really strong community that got tested really hard and was hated because of the price and obviously because of FTX and SBF, but now kind of became more consensus is Solana. Yeah. Yes. What are your thoughts on Solana? Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting when it was at the bottom. Many people who are who are kind of OGs in crypto and very deep into crypto were like, I think it's over for Solana. Uh, I, I mean, it's in hindsight, you can say this, but I always felt like the community, again, it as you can tell, like, Everything we talk about with crypto, it comes back to community. I mean, it's kind of a cliche, yeah. but it really is about the community. And Solana has that very strong core, uh, and it has a very solid community. 
it also, I think, differentiates very clearly from Ethereum in terms of the, the product itself, right? It's monolithic, whereas uh, Ethereum is more modular, right? You have, you need to have all these L2s and all that stuff. It's just a different solution. And I, and I often think of blockchains as kind of operating systems or browsers or something like that, where, yes, you have a leader, but you also get kind of, <coughs> you can carve out different markets for different solutions based on specific use cases and, and needs, right? So does it make sense to have a chain that is monolithic and has extremely low fees, but if you want to, by the way, we're in the data business, if you want to like support it from a data perspective, it's going to cost you a shit ton of money mm. and it's very complicated. That's one of the trade-offs, right? Uh, but does it make sense to have that kind of chain exist to be really good for certain use cases and then Ethereum exists for something else? I think absolutely. I don't think it's an either or at all, actually. I think it's totally possible that these two coexist. What's really interesting about the Solana case is a lot of people say, oh, Solana, I believe in it, but I don't believe the price can go up. We had Jordi Alexander here mm. before Solana pumped like crazy. Mm. He was saying, and I, on, <laughs> I, on purpose, I did that because I wanted to go poke Solana community, <laughs> right? Yeah. When actually I had like moved probably... And then he said the price couldn't go up? So, yeah, so basically I was there, you know, I got massively wrecked in Luna and he was right on Luna. Okay. And so I had moved just before that 70% of all my crypto into Sol because like, I think this is going to mm. be good. Then I test him live. Yeah. He tells me, yeah, it's good. It's good meme coin, but it's not going to go up. So I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, fuck, fuck, fuck. But anyway, I'm like, okay, whatever. Did you stick with and your connection? I, I, stay, I stuck with it. That's good. Good for you. So, but he says that, right? Yeah. And he says it's, it has a potentially bright, bright future, but it's, the price cannot go up, right? Or mm. should not, should not. It's more went like, to like coin. It went to like three or 400 in the last cycle, didn't it? Like 250? I think yeah. it was 250. Yeah. And for me, like, it's really like we have, I mean, him saying that obviously kind of proven wrong afterwards, yeah. which happens a lot in the, crypto. This, it's fine. I, I will but, admit the one, th and this is, this is purely for my own ignorance. I should probably read up on this, right? But one thing I don't get is fundamentally when you have a chain where you pay gas in the token and that's the primary use of the token mm. if the fees are very really low how do you drive the value is that's that was that his argument so or? his argument is that plus all the ftx real estate uh, ftx uh, uh overhang estate yeah, and, all okay. that, and yeah, plus a few yeah, other yeah. things which makes a lot of sense right but have you looked into this thing i mean we should we should probably have to like research this in advance <laughs> we should know this but uh but this is just one of those basic things where like with at least with ETH, you know you have to pay quite a lot of money to use the chain, yeah, right, and that's a natural demand driver. Yeah, I don't know. With Solana, it's like it's staking related or whatever. Yet ETH price not moving much. Yeah, right, and there yeah. are a lot of complaints yeah, about so, that. Yeah, so so there is one interesting thing I've observed in crypto. I don't know if this explains. I think it partially explains ETH and other coins like Maker and maybe even a coin like Lido. That's that fundamentals are often bearish <laughs> exactly you know? once and it's proven yeah. to work it's bearish you know that meme uh, not a meme you know that uh, scene from silicon valley where this kind of this investor angel investor says like don't talk about revenues you don't have yes. revenues yeah i think there's yeah. a bit of that effect where if you have revenues think of maker right it actually like it burns maker tokens based on you know the outstanding die or whatever that's at least what it used to be i don't know if they've changed the tokenomics <laughs> eth you know you burn eth based on how much people use the chain effectively right lido has basically revenue stream when you get those fundamentals people can then make the actual <clears throat> discounted cash flow models and whatnot yeah. and then they realize that actually like this is way overpriced but if there is no if there are no fundamentals and there's only memes then who knows mm. how high this can go, right? So this is, I think, it's a kind of a scary thought because <laughs> if that's true, then it suggests that all of crypto is like severely overvalued. But right? even in a, even in the startup world, like I've heard many times, hey, your your kind of chance to get a good valuation is your seed because you don't have anything to show yet, 
right? And therefore, once, once you start making revenue, or talk about revenue, but never talk about profit. If you're making profit, don't <laughs> okay. talk about profit. Okay, yeah. Like, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Anyway, very, very, it's like the complete opposite of the boring Swiss mindset, right? Right. I want to build a profitable company. Yeah, it's, it's that's super interesting if you think <laughs> of someone like Bill Ackman, mm. and he lays out like his investing style. I just listened to him talk about it. And it was like, this is literally the exact opposite of crypto. Like he wants something that is very predictable, that generates, you know, consistent profits. Mm -hmm. And this is like the inverse of <laughs> crypto is like super volatile. <laughs> it doesn't so really have fundamentals. Yeah. And that's also why, like, when you listen to, say, investors like Bill Ackman, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt if you're going to apply it to something like crypto because the game is so different, yeah. right? The game is more about things like community, about memes, about uh, how strong the hands are of the owners, which I think actually that's one area where the community and the token, they meet very in a very tangible and concrete way. If you have owners of, say, Pudgy Penguins, you manage to build up a community of people who just have very strong hands. You know they will just never sell it because they don't need to sell it. Absolutely. Or because they use it as their PFP and it will never change. Then the community translates into economics, right? Absolutely. It's like supply and demand. They're never going to give up those assets. And the one person who has to, or like the 10 people who have to sell it for whatever reason, you know, they don't have any competition from other sellers. And so the price is going to be very high, right? So I think like the community translates into economics in some tangible ways when you think about it from that perspective. Yeah. And this is, I don't, I don't mean to plug nonsense, but when you think about it, you'd, you want to know which addresses, which holders Absolutely. hold the, the token you're investing in. If it's some like seven day smart dex trader who's going to flip it tomorrow, yeah, maybe this is not a long-term bet, right? <laughs> But if this is a holder that you know has super strong conviction, they never sell, then it probably makes more sense to have a long-term position. Very last question about crypto, sort of alpha. You tweeted last night. I was done with all my preparation. Then I saw like at 1 a.m. or midnight. You tweet, I'm like, fuck, I need to add it to the thing. <laughs> BTC, six figures. ETH, <laughs> five figures. Sol, four figures. Penguins, three figures. Yeah. So the three figures is ETH in yeah, ETH, right? Of course, right? Of oh, course, okay, that was clear. Course. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was clear. Yeah, I mean, there's you nothing more to say. You think so four figure is possible? I mean, if if you, again, if you're heuristic, you're like, okay, Bitcoin, two, three X, therefore ETH, four X-ish, therefore Sol, whatever, five, ten, you look at the exactly. market cap so size. That's, that's the other thing, right? When you think about, again, valuation models, like Bill Ackman style investing, it does it kind of breaks down in this universe, right? So really? you have to think more about like comparables and also things like where has this traded before? Can it get back there? Can it go above there? Like people tend to often think about that in especially for Bitcoin, right? Hey, this cycle it's gonna go three X of the top of last cycle, yeah, exactly. all these different things, right? So it's it's always comparing either to other assets or to its history. And so it, again, if you just think supply demand if there is more supply coming in like su substantially more supply sorry uh more demand coming in like supply of capital the inverse way of thinking about it um and we know that Sol went to like 300 or whatever mm. right why shouldn't it go to a thousand or a thousand yeah yeah i mean like it's, again it's not a prediction it, it's just like yeah why why not it's basically the meme of the mid curve meme, right? Yeah. Don't if you're mid curving if you think, oh, but this that. Whereas like you're on the left or on the right of the curve if you just look at very simple heuristic, which is previous valuations, uh, and then you compare the market caps between each other and like, okay, if this one more or less two or three x, this yes. one has more less liquidity, probably gonna five x, and this one probably gonna ten x. Yeah. And it's not, never perfect, but at least you have like a yeah. very simple. I think crypto in that sense is kind of like a pure investment form because it's really all about supply and demand mm. you know it's that's really what it is about it's not like some future cash flows it's more about do you think there's going to be more demand for this asset in the future if so yeah why shouldn't price go up and of course 
a revenue stream or a kind of a burn mechanism can stimulate that for sure. But at the end of the day, like, do you think the Pudgy Penguins IP is going to have a broader reach in five years? Mm. I think absolutely, like no doubt. And so that's your thesis then. Yeah, like don't overcomplicate things. Don't, don't overcomplicate. You don't need to think more. It's just there's more demand and it's the same supply. Yeah. And the people who are holders are not going to sell. That's kind of what it comes down to. It's a very pure yeah. form of uh, investing, if you will. You tweeted about AI. Mm. And most people don't know it, but you have a degree in AI. I do. Why Before it was cool. Exactly. Why did you decide to study AI more than, what was it, 15 years ago? Yeah, that About was 15 four, years. Yeah, 14 years, 14, 15 years ago. Uh, I did my master's in AI. Um, <clears throat> I mean, so I did my undergrad in cognitive science, and that's the science of thinking, if you will. And a part of that is to create models that try to... M So say mathematical or computer models that try to mimic the way humans think. And I, f I think I always had a fascination for AI from video games. It was always kind of interesting to think when you're playing as a computer, how does it know to do what, you know, it's doing? And of course, also a fascination through science fiction movies like Blade Runner um, that I love. It's one of my favorite movies, I think drew me towards AI initially. And it's interesting because I graduated in 2010. And since then, you've had two, I think, revolutions in the AI field. The first one was the whole deep learning thing that happened around 2013, 14 with AlexNet and so on, which basically made it, made, uh, you had a major a leap forward in terms of the accuracy of things like image recognition to some extent, uh, or like object recognition in images. And um, to some extent, natural language understanding and so on. And then I guess 2019 or so with uh, generalized pre-trained transformers or GPTs, mm. uh, attention is all you need, I think was the paper. Um, and of course, with chat GPT, it went really mainstream. <coughs> and so I think that it's on the one hand, I'm happy I studied AI because it's huge part of the future like some understanding of it is good on did the other you, hand did you know or did you go or use more like i think i'm interested it seemed in very obvious like that's mm. going to happen right i mean it, it just seemed super obvious this mm. was a time when people were saying things like data scientist is going to be the sexiest job of the yeah. 21st century so it, it, it felt like of course you're going to have more data and of course you're going to get better technology at processing that data and of course humans are not going to hand code all the algorithms. So you're going to have to do some form of machine learning and the machine learning is probably going to accelerate and you're going to get some form of AI and AGI eventually. It, it seems kind of inevitable, right? Mm -hmm. In the, uh, the arc of like history and the future. Um, but but the, the kind of frustration I have with having studied AI so early is that it's changed so much. Right, so the the methods we were studying were very different. It was kind of a different paradigm, like ensemble models and you know uh, gradient boosting machines, like stuff that you wouldn't use now. They're kind of outdated. Yeah. But of course, neural nets and the the basics of that and how to evaluate machine learning models and all that stuff. Of course, I studied and spent a lot of time with uh, and worked with afterwards too. Um, but now I feel like I'm kind of I'm jumping back into AI. And spending much more time on it, but mostly from, a, well, really from two perspectives. One is, you know, how should we think about AI at, at Nansen and, and how, how does it affect us and what opportunities and threats does it create? And then also for me personally, using AI as an early adopter of AI products. So, Do you want to develop on both? Yeah. So <clears throat> if we start with the Nansen part, right? Uh, the Nansen's AI strategy, I think, firstly, it, it splits into two things. The first one is we need to use AI to make the product better. Okay. So there are certain things you can do now that you just couldn't do before. And that's super exciting. And you have to make the product better using AI. It's a very broad statement. I know. And I'll... But even more so in the data analytics space, right? Correct. Absolutely. Correct. Correct. And I think like the two, the two ways, if you sort of drill down on that, the two main ways 
it changes everything. The first one is the interfacing with data. So very like even maybe this year, certainly I think next year and definitely the year after, it'll be pretty common to just speak with data, I think. For example, like the dashboard and the traditional way of visualizing stuff is kind of like a middleman between you and the data. Absolutely. Right? And so I, I'm not saying the dashboard is going to go away, but I think like having a more direct way to communicate with data, not necessarily like a chat, because I do think people want something visual. But I always think of that scene in Blade Runner where Rick Deckard is on the sofa and he's examining this photograph with the with the, this device he has, and he speaks with the device. He's like, pan right, zoom in, enhance. Mm. And it's kind of a voice and visual user experience. I think the way we're going to interact with data and analytics might be a bit similar, where you speak with the data, and then you get visuals on the screen because we are visual beings. Mm. You, want, you can't just have text, or you can't have complicated information only communicated to you through voice. I think you want to have a multimodal kind of voice and visual type experience. So the interfacing of data is one part of the product. The other part is deepening the data moat, right? So creating data sets and metrics and so on w using AI that are very hard to replicate for other products so that our product is unique, right? You want to have a moat as a company. You don't want yep. your product to just be replicated yep. overnight. And so making use of AI in that, in things like attribution, labeling addresses, creating new metrics that themselves make use of proprietary data that you've created, building kind of like a stack of unique this data assets and analytical assets. This is essentially the way Spotify or Netflix or even Amazon yeah. project themselves because, okay, we, we see something very personalized, but it's all because of the intelligence that That's has true. been built in the back end, right? That's right. And actually, like, I think personalization is probably the, maybe the third thing mm -hmm. that helps you create a moat in the AI world. Uh, and I think like the movie Her is the kind of extreme example of this where the guy falls in love with the AI. I don't know if you've seen it. You, yeah, should, you seen, should watch yeah, it. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen, yeah. yeah, okay, cool. So he falls in love with the AI and that's like an extreme version of it. But if you just think about that, obviously that guy is in love with the AI. He's never going to change products, right? So he has lock-in. He has He's very locked in. The retention rates are like 100%. Yep. Um, similarly, Again, I don't think Nelson necessarily needs to people have people fall in love with it. But if you kind of like get closer yep. to that, yep. then they would never switch because Nelson like has all your preferences. Yep. It's the most convenient. It's convenient. It knows like how you want to consume data. It has the qualitative research stuff. It has the community messages and data and, and the kind of sentiment. And it has all the on-chain data for all the different chains in one place. And we are humans and we don't like to switch and change things anyway. So if the thing is really good, yeah. there's zero reason to switch. Yeah, why would you switch, yeah. right? So that's, that's kind of, that's the product piece. Yep. The other piece, which also ties into how I use uh, AI a lot myself day to day, is for organizational productivity. And I think this part is more generalizable to other companies. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of more to learn from this part. Uh, because what I've noticed is you can like literally sometimes do things in like 1% of the time. Uh, than you Absolutely. could before, which is kind of insane to think about. <laughs> but, I've, uh, but, but I've experienced this firsthand many times in the last six months working with ChatGPT. Even intellectual work, when you're creating the strategy of a product or something like that, just having ChatGPT the, the, Chat there to bounce ideas off of, Sorry. like inputting the what you have and say like, what is missing, what's bad, there's like, they're always available 24 seven. They never get tired. They are never distracted, right? And you can just speak with them. And the other thing here, by the way, is I think the voice version of ChatGPT has, for me, has been kind of a game changer because I can walk outside and work. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can say, hey, I'm working on this strategy. I have these components. I wanna develop this fourth one. Can you help me think through this? And then it just tells me stuff. And now you're having a conversation with what feels like a human, 
because the even the the voice is so good in ChatGPT. If you configure it, the mm -hmm. default one is not good, but you can change it. Um, anyway, so you can drive these this incredible organizational productivity and individual productivity with ChatGPT and other AI tools that I think is just astonishing. And so then you have to think about that. If you're running a company, you have to change a lot of stuff, yeah. right? And you have to think very differently about many things. So Because not everyone is Alex, right? Not everyone is like, oh, that's so cool. I mean, obviously the people that you hire, you mm. hope that they're, they love technological change and technology savvy, but like not everyone is like as- As even, enthusiastic. Even, or <laughs> yeah. or yeah. If, maybe they are, but they're not realizing AI could do that. Yeah. Or AI could yeah. help me there, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, so this is a good point, right? So the I actually think the first very basic challenge that we had to overcome was actually to your point, literally get people to just use AI, yep. use ChatGPT. Because you can say, hey, have you tried ChatGPT? You should use it. Yeah, yeah, I've tried it, what, whatever. But what we said is, if we think about the AI strategy and the goals for this year, the first quarter, I don't care about what results you create with AI. I only care about how many hours you have spent working with AI. And so collectively as a company, we are aiming to spend 5,000 hours in Q1. Okay. Which, and, and like you could say, oh, why don't you just state that in like how many hours per week per mm. team member? Mm. But I think actually when you say 5,000, it makes you think like, shit, the amount of productivity you can get from like 5,000 hours yep. with AI is kind of insane, yep. right? Imagine how many content pieces, documents, uh, how much more you can code. The output you have is just going to be enormous from 5,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And so that was step one to just make sure that people are spending time. And we started monitoring it. Um, of course, just survey-based, very simple, and like trust-based. People kind of just say at the end of the week, here's mm -hmm. how many hours I spent, and here are all the tools I used. And then collectively, we are learning about which tools to use as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a, yeah, it's a collective learning experience. Um, so that's step one, just get people to use it. Mm -hmm. And then you get these emergent use cases pop up and people, because I can't plan top down how everyone should use AI, of course. Like people are going to have so many great ideas in the organization that I would never have thought of. Absolutely. So yeah, so anyway, to sum, sum things up, right? It's basically the product innovation piece yeah. where I think everything's going to change with regards to how people consume data and analytics. And then it's the organizational productivity piece where uh, for now we are <laughs> only focused on the input. Are you spending enough mm. time with AI? That's the only thing I care about. And the outcomes we're going to switch focus to, you know, Q2 onwards. There's another, there's another kind of area where it's funny, but actually it's true. Where AI uh, has a potentially big impact, which is relationships. Mm. And so I remember when G GPT-3 was, what, when was that? November 2022, something like that? Maybe, yeah. GPT-4 is later. G yeah, yeah mm. so, so I remember, I mean, I had a girlfriend for quite some time and we had a lot of arguments. Mm. And I seemed to be not, taking the right approach every time. So the argument would get bigger when I try to like solve it, right? And there's this GPT thing that gets out and I'm like, I'm just gonna try to ask chat GPT how I should solve this argument, right? Yeah. And freaking GPT like gives me over seven steps, yeah. right? And it was not, it was not a, a, a voice argument, it was just texting, right. so it helps, right? So I'm like, I look at the seven step, I kind of like tailor make them, I send this to her and then the opposite of what you happy, uh, happens, happy, uh, happened basically, which is usually whatever I say, probably because I'm a, an idiot, like I, it, it makes the thing worse. I use GPT and then she's like, ah, okay, it's fine. And I'm like, fuck man. I mean, I was like- So it worked. It saying. worked amazingly. Oh, because I was going to ask you, this is why you, she's your ex girl. <laughs> no, that's, not, that's not the reason. <laughs> okay. Anyway. okay. Yeah. So it actually worked. Okay. It worked that time. It worked mm -hmm. that time, but it was probably too late. Well, it's, it's and, a good point. So it, I think it, it AI weirdly makes humans better at communicating mm. with each other, mm. which is very counterintuitive. You'd imagine that two people can just talk together directly, but a middleman, an AI, can can actually enhance yeah. the communication. Which is pretty crazy, but makes a lot of sense. And even mm. you were talking before about um, 
the the film where he falls in love right, with, uh, with an AI. Yeah. Her. And so I'm an advisor in a project called Open Spark Angel.ai, mm. AI girlfriends. I mean, AI mm. companions. So it's starting with AI girlfriends and then AI boyfriends and then therapists and all that stuff, right? Yeah. And the other day I was, there is a functional product on WhatsApp, Telegram. And the other day I was just like testing something stupid, which is I'm going to tell my AI girlfriend that I fucked another girl just to see <laughs> how she reacts, right? Yeah. The reaction of the AI, I was like, damn, if every woman, she was like, so, sort of like, oh, okay, it's fine. Like, how was it? And like being very wow. chill. And I was like, wow. Unemotional. Like, like if woman, obviously not possible, right? But if a woman was like that, you would you would, you would never even think about cheating on her because like this woman is so oh, chill, yeah. you know? So, and I also saw a tweet like maybe a few weeks ago from you where you said, my wife has started to use chat GPT to win arguments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm screwed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's just funny. I mean, that's like literally, <clears throat> literally what happened. Um, because we were, we, so we have a, we have a, a daughter who's, you know, uh, soon going to be one years, one year old. And so we talk a lot about stuff like, should we do this? Should we do that? And I'm like, we, we're from different cultures too. So I had different opinions and different backgrounds on what's mm -hmm. the right way to raise a kid. And now she will like settle the debate with a chat GPT screenshot, you know, hey, you can feed her this thing because blah, blah, blah. And chat GPT told me so. And I'm like, well, what, how can I compete with that? You know, I, I have nothing to say. Let's trust chat GPT. <laughs> what I've heard is uh, some people, they just kind of like get equipped with their own chat GPT. So I could get my own chat GPT yeah. and say, hey, my girlfriend said this convince her that this oh, yeah, is wrong yeah. <laughs> and then you can just go back and forth uh, outsourcing the argument yeah. in a way but wow. yeah talking about your wife this is a really interesting topic that i think can be very valuable and helpful for a lot of people um of our age you know early mid 30s mm. or late 20s we had a dinner a bit more than two years ago and we we're like ready to get to the next stage of your life, which is find a wife and having kids, right? Because you were saying, oh, I'm in my mid thirties or mm. like, this is really important for me right now. And within 18 months, you found a woman, you married her mm. and you got a kid. Yeah. And knowing you, it's probably, probably didn't happen by chance. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm a single man in my mid thirties and my goal mm. is to settle down and have babies as soon as possible, what should I do? How do I optimize sort of like the dating process mm. to find the right woman. Yeah. Uh, I do actually think, I mean, th th it's funny, like you can ask that question and I'm happy to talk about that. But most people would think of the question itself as like very cynical or rational and unemotional. But I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And and one way to think about it, I think, is... Uh, in terms of almost like marketing, if you're like creating a marketing strategy and you have to think about what channels can you succeed in, right? And so I'll give you one example. By the way, this is actually not super relevant for how I met my wife, but it was a pretty good strategy in my, in my 20s, let's say, uh, which is what is the channel that you have the highest conversion rate in, right? And uh, the default channel that people will take, by the way, is like a nightclub or a bar or so, at least historically. Yeah. Maybe that's changing a little bit now. Uh, now it's like, of course, dating apps, I think, yeah. is kind of the default maybe. Uh, uh, one channel that I was using a lot, I think now people have figured it out and it's kind of more crowded and competitive, was language exchange. Mm. And so this is kind of a, <laughs> it's a kind of a pro tip. Uh, if you're learning a new language... First of all, it seems like there are more women than men that mm. want to learn languages. So the generation is pretty good. The other thing is you are literally there to speak with other people. And so it's totally harmless to go up and chat with anyone mm. in the venue. And then, you know, third, you have, like, if you find someone you like, you have an excuse to ask, like, you want to meet up for chat more in whatever language. Uh, and by the way, it's a good idea if you're learning like multiple languages because then you have 
like more <laughs> options. <laughs> <laughs> so this is so the first thing I think is like being actually mindful of the channel that you're in, it, it, because the other, if you take a step back, it is actually a numbers game, right? Like you you actually have to think of it as like there's a top of the funnel process where like you're kind of looking for candidates, if you will. And you do have to, there's no way around it. Like you have to just manage a lot of time considering candidates and finding candidates. And, and of course it's, it's, a, it's a, it's obviously something where you have to match both ways, which makes it like s square the difficulty yeah, in a way. Exactly. And so, so for, number one is number scheme num and acknowledge that number two, if it's a number scheme, how do you kind of optimize your time, i.e. your conversion rate? In terms of just kind of like, even like getting to the next stage of the relationship or like having a second date, mm -hmm. even getting on a date in the first place. Um, so language has changed. That was kind of my pro tip there. Dating apps, I think, are quite difficult because they are very crowded. And it's, it's first of all, there are many different dating apps and you have different strategies mm -hmm. in the different ones. And being a man is much more difficult than being a woman yes. on a dating app. At least and, to get the first... Yeah. Date, That's right. right. And then I, th I think there are two other things to consider. You have to have a very clear idea of what kind of partner you want to have. Right? That sounds very basic, but you actually need to do that homework. And I, and I had done that. I've thought a lot about that. And I've, you know, I'd written down certain like, you know, f traits yeah. that I wanted to have. But when you do that, again, be thinking rationally about the numbers, you have to think about... These traits, if you combine them, statistically, how many people match these traits? Mm -hmm. And may many, many people might find that actually there are like 100 people in the world that match all of yeah. these traits. So then you have to tier and stack rank. <clears throat> these are must-haves. These are nice-to-haves. Mm -hmm. And actually having like a clear idea on that is pretty good because y when you meet people, you have to fail fast, right? As you see in the yep. startup world. Yep. Hey, look, this person... They don't have that trait, which is must have for me. You know, let's just end it here. And for them and for you, you know, you don't want to waste your time. So knowing actually what you're looking for, but in a pretty concrete way, like literally write out, I think maximum seven must have traits. Probably mm -hmm. it's more like two or three or four or whatever. And then some nice to haves. And I think people tend to be distracted by the nice to haves, actually. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you know, I like, I don't know, blonde girls or whatever, but is it truly a must have yeah. or is it more like you kind of like that and then you go there and then you go into a relationship or whatever and the must haves are not present and then everything falls apart mm. and you wasted a lot of time. And must haves basically are based on your values. Yeah, typically they're, they're, they're values, they're behaviors, mm. they're like, uh, for example, you know, I, I don't like, it is very very like simple behavioral thing, but I couldn't be with someone who is not friendly to strangers. Mm. Okay. So if you're like rude to waiters or like, that's yeah. to me kind of like a sign that yeah. we just don't have the same values. Yeah. And, and that's something you can actually spot pretty fast, mm. right? If you go on a date and they're like rude or whatever, or yeah. on the other end, if they're polite with people, strangers, that's kind of a good sign. Uh, I mean, in my case, that's what I, one of the very simple traits I would look for. Um, and so, yeah, so, so then, sorry, the, the last thing, you know, you know what you want, uh, you know which channels you can compete in. And then you match both. And there's a numbers game. And the fourth thing is you have to also think about the people you want, are they in that channel? Exactly. You match the channel and yes. the people you, and then you're like, oh, maybe there's only one or two channels that I should focus on, right? Correct. I mean, it's very... And yeah. so that's the thing. Like, if you like alternative girls, eh, maybe don't go to clubs, mm -hmm. you know? Maybe go where, I don't know, alternative girls hang out. Yeah. Whatever that is, like museum or, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, I think there are, it is actually worth sitting down and, like, developing strategies around this stuff. And it sounds weird. You probably shouldn't tell people <laughs> that you're doing it because <laughs> I don't think it helps you. Uh, frankly, uh, but uh, but it's a good idea, I think. Very last one. We have about two minutes left. It's the same one, but reversed. You're a man, so you understand how men think. Mm. 
what would you advise a woman in her 30s who feels pressured by her biological clock or by society? Yeah. Uh, how should she approach the dating game to meet her husband and have kids as quickly as possible, knowing that you understand men and how they think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the way I was talking about this comes from my perspective as a man looking for a woman. Uh, I do think the process is largely the same. Mm. Uh, you know, you want to understand who is the partner you want to be with. By the way, this, in order to get the, to understand that, you first need to understand yourself pretty well. And you probably need to have gone through some failed relationships. Yeah. Right. So, but when you're in your 30s, you probably have done that. Yeah. And so I think the process is largely the same with the, maybe the except, the difference being that men, you know, if we're being honest, are easier than women. So the time wasted is in a different part of the funnel, right? So if you're a man, you waste a lot of time, I think, at the top of the funnel. You're like trying to find someone to go on a date with or like convince them or whatever. Yeah. But if you're a woman, you might w waste time with someone who is not interested in what you want, like a long-term relationship. Very common problem. It's for easy many to get women. access to all these men, but uh, then you Correct. need to figure out Correct. whether he's serious or not. So exactly. And, and I think like this is an area where, of course, people have different views. I think if you're in your 30s, it probably makes sense to just be very open about that, but maybe not the very first date, but, yeah. you know, but because uh, you scare some people away. At the same time, if the other person wants the same thing. If you scare him away, if you're a woman. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Like yeah, you're basically exactly. more efficient with your time. Yeah. Like, ah, so, you're not serious. So okay, I think out. like the principle like, of failing fast is yeah. actually very yeah. important. Um, and, and yeah, uh, you know, that... Uh, there's no, this is not a guarantee for success, but to go to back to one of the other points, it is a numbers game. So like you actually have to spend a lot of time on it. You have to put right? in the work. You have to put in the work. Yeah. There's no way around that, frankly. And that can be fun or it can be uh, not so fun. Depends on your personality and all that. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing that, man. Thanks that for awesome. having me. Always a pleasure.